Don't be like health guru Brian Johnson, who seemingly repeated this workout each week because it was scientifically the best. That's how an extremely well-written article by coach Steve Magnus on exercise training history finishes. So this article provides a wonderful overview of the history of exercise training and the lessons learned over the decades. And I want to share some of these insights with you so that we can make sure that we're maximizing our benefits from our own exercise plans in the limited time that we've got. Then I'll share whether I agree with his critique of Brian Johnson or not. So something hugely significant happened in the world of running in 1896, so that was the year of the first modern Olympics, and that meant that runners were competing on the world stage, with their performances being a matter of national pride and prestige, and suddenly, there was a lot more attention on the best runners, and that led to more attention about how they got that way. So people started to focus on training methods as never before. So for runners and those who trained them, there was a strong incentive to find the best method to produce athletes who could win these races. So imagine it's 1905, you're standing on the edge of an unmarked track watching a runner named Named Joe Binks stroll out for his weekly workout. He sprints a few 60 yard bursts and then he goes home. A few miles away, another champion called Len Hurst trudges through the endless walks, insisting that patience and plodding miles are the only way to build a champion. So, two men, two extremes high volume, low intensity versus low volume, high intensity. So, who's right? Well, at the dawn of the 20th century, nobody knew. There were no textbooks, there was no GPS watches, there was just opinion, ego, and gut instinct. Fast forward to the 1920s, and a skinny Finnish kid named Paavo Nermi looked at the giants of his era and wonders if there's another way. So instead of picking a side in the volume versus intensity war, he combines them. So long walks in the morning, steady runs in the afternoon, and short sprints at night. So to his competitors, this looks a bit crazy, but the medals, they start piling up. So maybe a more balanced approach is the way forward. Now, in this period, we see a rise of an emphasis on intervals, but there were still disagreements about the ideal mix. So how short should the intervals be? How many should we do? What intensity level was right? And efforts to answer these questions led to a revolutionary development. One approach to the problem was taken by a Swedish coach in the 1930s, and he was called Josta Homer. So he took his athletes into the forest, and he says, run by feel. He sent them surging and slowing over hills, and he invented the fartlek, or speed play. So no stopwatches, no strict recovery breaks, just humans learning how their bodies respond to change. So his methods were informal, but they worked. But a German scientist named Waldemar Juschler, he watches and he scoffs, and he says, not precise enough. He wants to strap heart rate monitors to his runners, and he orders 30-second bursts, followed by measured recoveries, and he calls it interval training. Yoshler was using scientific precision to guide his athletes toward the ideal workout to maximize their performance and precisely answer the volume versus intensity debate, rather than the run-by-feel approach by Josta Homer. But neither side wins outright. Then comes Emil Zytopek in the late 1940s. So he was a Czech soldier with a grin and an iron will, and he turns Yoshta's intervals into an obsession. So he runs 400 meters 60 times, day in, day out, rain or shine. He trains so hard that his fellow soldiers think he's mad. But then at the 1952 Olympics, he wins the 5K, 10K and marathon, leaving the world speechless. And suddenly, everyone wants to know a secret. Then another coach, Franz Stamfel, thinks that Zytopek has missed the point that intervals should be few and fast. So he designs workouts like the 400 meters, but only 10 times, and he runs them at blistering speeds. His pupil, Roger Bannister, uses them to crack the four-minute mile. And again, success breeds imitation. The pendulum slams towards intensity. But in a small New Zealand town, a milkman named Arthur Lydiard, he watches this craze and he worries. His own lungs burn when he tries these short, sharp sessions, so he thinks that there must be a better way. Lydiard experiments on himself, running further and further until the 100-mile week feels normal. He creates a training pyramid with months of long aerobic training, then hills and then sharpening speed work. His athletes, who were previously unknown amateurs, suddenly dominate the Olympic finals, and the stakes couldn't be higher. Lydiard's success isn't just personal, it rewrites the coaching manuals and it gives small nations the belief that they can topple giants, but not everyone buys in. Across the Tasman Sea, eccentric Aussie coach Percy Chotity, he marched his athletes up sand dunes and he preaches a stolen living. So no sugar, barefoot running, heavy weightlifting. He despises the scientific training method and he mocks interval coaches. Herb Elliott thrives under Chertity and he smashes world records. And again, we're left to ask, is the answer in the stopwatch or the sand dunes? The scientific precision versus run by feel. By the 1960s, another thread appears. So in Oregon, a university coach called Bill Bowerman, he reads Lydiard's books and he travels to New Zealand. And he returns home impressed with mileage, but alarmed at the monotony. So he mixes Lydiard's distance with a simple rule. So hard days followed by easy days. 
Recovery isn't weakness. It's part of his plan and his athletes, such as Steve Prefontaine, and countless others become legends. Bowman's emphasis on recovery days seems so obvious now that we forget how revolutionary it was at the time, and only later have scientists confirmed that adaptation happens in the space between efforts. By the 1970s, it looks like a golden age, with high mileage of two to three hard sessions per week that have become the norm. But human nature being what it is, moderation doesn't last. And what happens next is an important lesson for all of us. In the 1980s, Peter Coe, he takes his son Sebastian and he compresses the training pyramid. So long, slow distance makes slow runners, he reportedly quips. He keeps mileage modest and he pushes speed all year. And across the track, Steve Ovitz coach, Harry Wilson, takes a different approach. He adds mileage and hills, blending Lydiard's distance training and intervals. So Co with his speed training and Ovitz with distance and interval training, trade world record and Olympic titles. But fans argue, whose method is right? And here's where sports science enters the fray. So coaches brand workouts such as VO2 max sessions, lactate threshold runs, and prescribe exact paces from charts. Precision is in. Feel is out, and in the short term, the co-style of training which focused on speed produces fireworks. But in the long run, many Western programs, they start to decline. By the 1990s, Britain and USA, they start to struggle. An entire generation of athletes plateau on a diet of too many intense interval trainings and too little endurance. Fast forward to today, where have things landed? Well, exercise physiologists have reviewed the logs of elite endurance athletes, and they find that most of them spend 75 to 80% of their time at low intensity and only a small fraction at high intensity. They call it polarized or pyramidal training. And to anyone who's read Lydia its training pyramid, it's old news. So what lessons should we take for our own exercise plans, and what do I think about Steve's critique of Brian Johnson at the end of his article? Well, there are five key takeaways that can help us make a smarter approach to training. So first, we need both volume and intensity. So early on, there was a debate about which was the best for creating great runners, but that debate has faded over time, as we found out that peak performance requires both. They accomplish different things, so we need a mix of exercise types and intensities to maximize our gains. And we can see the practical importance in studies of those who aren't elite athletes. So for example, a meta-analysis looked at different types of exercise in overweight adults. They found that exercise programs that combined resistance training and endurance training had the largest overall impact on a broad range of health metrics, so that included body composition, cholesterol levels, blood sugar regulation, and blood pressure. Second, recovery is an essential element of exercise. It can sound counterintuitive because many of us think that the harder that we train, the greater benefits we'll see, and I've had patients who dive into high-intensity exercise every day, but we've learned that that isn't a smart strategy. Exercise stresses our bodies, and it gets stronger in response. So in resistance training, for instance, our muscles sustain minor damage, But our bodies need adequate time for these repair processes and other responses to exercise to play out. So exercise without sufficient rest will undermine our gains. So personally, I aim for about two high-intensity interval training workouts a week, and the rest of the week is dedicated to other types of exercise. The third key takeaway is that guiding our training using precision methods, or instead relying on a more intuitive feel, both of these strategies can work. We can be the person who tracks our heart rates with a smartwatch and adjusts our workout accordingly, Or we can use a rough guideline, like run at a fast pace until you're feeling winded, and then switch to a slower pace for a few minutes of recovery. So I like the run by feel approach because I like to delete and simplify where possible, but that's my own personal approach. Fourth, there is no single best workout. It's tempting to look for one though. We all want to maximize the benefits in the limited time that we've got for exercise. And that's what draws us to these health influences and the latest version of the perfect workout. And if you know anything about Brian Johnson, you know he's always on the lookout for the scientifically best approach to health optimization. So he's included the trendy four by four minute workout in his routine, which online is touted to be one of the best scientific workouts. And in fairness, the workout protocol that he gives on his site is fairly nuanced. So I don't agree with this particular critique of Brian Johnson at the end of Steve Magnus's article, but the tendency online is to identify the ideal workout and stick with it. But as history of elite athletes shows us, that approach is misguided. Whatever workout we're doing, our bodies will naturally adapt, and we need to adjust our routine to continually see gains. Growth takes variety. Finally, everything works to a degree. Does loading up on volume at low intensity improve our fitness and health? Yes. Does staring towards high intensity, low volume sessions help? Also, yes. Does doing whatever the latest health influence has recommended online help? Probably yes as well. And here I'm thinking particularly of when we're sedentary. So for many, the biggest challenge is simply to start moving to go from inactive to active. So according to data from the World Health Organization, about a third of adults worldwide don't meet the recommended levels of physical activity. And that share is growing and that's crucial to grasp. 
because moving from sedentary to getting in at least some movement pays huge dividends. So consider these numbers. A study of non-exercisers used wearable devices to track how often they engaged in short bursts of vigorous activity during the day. This included things like climbing stairs and unloading groceries. So those who got in just six minutes a day of this type of activity had an incredible 38 to 40% lower risk of cancer and all-cause mortality compared to those who got no exercise in. So the most important thing is to simply start moving more. Anything that helps us do that is great, and we don't want to delay because we're worried about the optimal training protocol. Exercise snacks, for example, is a great way to get started, and it's something that I do both at the clinic and at home when I'm writing YouTube scripts or working on rapamycin clinical studies. Then moving forward from that, if time is limited, it's generally better to focus on high intensity exercises, so long as they're done safely. But once a patient has got a bit more time to exercise, then adding in lower intensity workouts, such as zone 2 training, makes sense. But there's one last thing that I tell my patients at the clinic, and that's the importance of power training, which is a type of exercise that many people leave out. So power is distinct from strength, and it has to do with how quickly we can generate force with our muscles. So interestingly, it declines more quickly than strength as we age, and it looks like it's more important when it comes to maintaining physical function. Moreover, a significant recent analysis looked at about 4,000 individuals over a 10-year follow-up period, and the findings suggest that power is a stronger predictor of mortality compared to strength. So power training involves combining strength and speed. So in one study of exercise of older adults, for instance, participants used power training approaches. They were instructed to perform the exercise movements as quickly as possible, and they wore weighted vests to increase resistance. In the end, it's critical to remember the ultimate goal. We want the largest benefit that we can get from exercise in the limited time that we have for it. And the lessons from history of elite runner training can help us avoid some of the fads and stick to what has stood the tests of time. And if you need a bit of extra motivation to get started, check out this next video. I unpack a recent study with some mind-blowing numbers on about how big an impact exercise has on keeping us physically young.